Why, thank you and welcome everyone along to this fascinating session. Um, I've been working in the area of, of being a CEO or being chair of boards for close on 45 years. So I've seen a lot of things over those times. In the last 20 years, I've been primarily advising other boards on strategy, risk, governance, and so on. But the, the main thing in this is that uh, the great hope that I see in the world is the work that boards and the senior executive teams and the whole cohort of people that are working in our sectors the, the quality that we see happening there. So I look forward to having this chat with you. Linda. Linda, over to you. Thank you. So uh, kia ora, I'm Linda Carroll from Align Group. Uh, we specialise in aligning strategy, governance, culture and performance um, across all different sectors. I've been um, a company director for over 25 years and am a chartered fellow of the Institute of Directors in New Zealand. I'm also an accredited foresight practitioner through the Institute for the Future in Sao Paulo, California, and that's why I'm so excited to be here listening to Dean's insights around the future of the boards. Thanks, Linda. And finally, without uh, further ado, we have uh, Dean. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sean. It's lovely to be with Linda and Steve, and uh, good to have you all aboard today. Um, I'm won't introduce myself specifically. Uh, most of what you need is probably on my LinkedIn profile, but maybe let me link that and tee up the topic as I go. Um, I think most of you will be familiar of the old adage, structure follows strategy, and certainly as a corporate strategy practitioner, that's something we always used to bear in mind. And by structure, one doesn't just mean org structure, but sort of the org organizational arrangements around that, which is broader than just structure. So structure follows strategy, as most of us know. Um, the interest for me in this particular topic, the genesis for it came out of um, sort of, not just the sort of the strategic um, development work I was doing, but also work on what you might call the operating model, which is how do you operationalize the strategy where structure follows strategy. So how do you wire up the enterprise, if you like, <clears throat> so that it's capable of delivering its strategic intent. So it's got the capability sets it requires. And so that really means a mix of processes, use of technology, skills, attitudes and ways of working, uh, data and management systems. How do you bring all of those things to bear so that you can actually operationalize or execute your strategy? So that's where so strategy meets transformation how do we transform the operating model to support this i also have a bit of a background in governance having stumbled on the topic when i was doing advanced company law in the early 90s and subsequently touched on it in my phd um, so as you start thinking about it and that's really where i want to tee up the topic today um, it struck me as interesting that as organizations develop what you could call fit for purpose operating models. They design their operating models. Remember their process, their structures, their skills, their ways of working, their use of technology. As they develop fit for purpose operating models to support their strategy, um, and that's an ongoing process um, through waves of change, et cetera, I was not seeing the same changes happening at board level. And so it struck me as a little bit strange, if you like, that organizations have their own fit for purpose operating models, which you could say, you know, sometimes are good, sometimes aren't so good, but generally they try and make them fit for purpose. But boards looked quite similar in many ways. We all have somewhat similar structures, the various committee structures we have, we have similar processes, we start the work weeks in advance preparing board papers, we put out minutes, we run meetings, etc., with agendas, we use technology, whether it's Broad Pro or something else, um, or maybe Excel or other uh, enablers in the meeting room, et cetera. The skills um, of our board members may be slightly different, but they're not usually different as a sweeping generalization. Their backgrounds aren't all that different, et cetera. So where am I going with this? I was observing quite a significant amount of homogeneity in the board operating models, the processes, structures, ways of working, skills, etc., management systems of boards. So a lot of homogeneity, but quite a bit of variability or heterogeneousness, if you like, in the operating model. So it struck me as, well, that's interesting, and how does that all work? 
So as I was leaving um, EY after my second stint, I approached the Center for Global Board Matters and said, let's look at whether board operating models are really keeping pace with the changes that are coming. So that's a long tee up, but I also wanted to introduce some terminology to you about operating models because that's the lens that some of this is examined through. So the first assertion is that the unitary governance model, you know, that we're all familiar with is the creation of a bygone era where news came via steamship or telegram or train. Um, you had concentrated ownership, uh, often patient capital wasn't dispersed. Um, you had relatively fewer suppliers. You had patient um, investors, and you didn't have, you might have had several markets, but we didn't have this great dispersion that we have today. And so news traveled more slowly, decisions could be made at a more sedate pace, et cetera. And the question is, how different is it today? Well, I think you all know the answers. So that raises the question, well, does that operating model for governance still work? And uh, my research with EY covered about, um, uh, well, a large number of their clients. We did about 90 interviews. This is in 2021. Um, we spoke to the directors of the top six on the ASX. We spoke to the CFOs of the top five of the ASX as well. So directors of the top six and CEO CFOs of the, uh, of the top 10. Um, they covered between them about 64 publicly listed companies and about 30 private companies, and then a whole range of other institutions like university bodies, et cetera. So it's quite a sweeping view that we got. Um, and a number of them are not-for-profit boards. Um, now you could say, well, maybe some of these assertions relate to big complicated boards that are in the public eye, but I'll leave you to form that view. So what came out of this? We can roll forward now, please, Sean. Uh, six key findings uh, that related to some of our working hypotheses. And for many of those directors, the risk focus was debilitating and distracting. They were feeling very much like in the, in the crosshairs um, and uh, to some degree unnerved. And of course, there was a question in their heads about whether the risk return payoff um, really made sense in terms of the demands, expectations, risk of liability, et cetera. And of course, that leads to then unintended consequences that maybe people who ought to be directors, who are skilled and contribute as non-executive directors are driven away, certainly out of public companies, but you could argue certainly also private companies because liabilities are the same, just scrutiny varies. The information overload, significant, and I think many of you will feel it in your board roles. And I'm not just talking about the, the length of PACs, even if they artfully designed and developed by executives, um, there is still a huge amount that you've got to stay across uh, and keep track of. And of course, the topic domain is growing all the time, uh, whether it's D, uh, E and I, whether it's sustainability, whether it's cyber, whether it's digital transformation, et cetera, the topic domain is, is not shrinking. Uh, I've touched on the LED, NEDS, non-executive directors liability impost. Um, the skills required to stay abreast of these new topics and emerging topics aren't making their ways onto the boards fast enough. Often those guys and girls are in their early 30s. Um, they're in full-time employment. And so the question is, how do we really tap them? Um, using an ex-CIO or CTO, with all love and respect, even if they were and are still really good, they might not have done a digital or data transformation themselves. Um, then we're in this early stage of transition to ES, and we can drop the G for a moment. Um, and what does that mean? It means we are moving from shareholder focus where the rules are known, the key constituents are known, the expectations are known, uh, the metrics are known, and we're all familiar with it, into an ES world where the rules are emerging, the metrics are emerging, the compliance requirements are emerging, and the demands of various stakeholder groups are also emerging. We don't necessarily know exactly who wants what, how much priority to give to them, et cetera, et cetera. So the rules of the game are changing and it makes it awkward. Whether you are strongly in one camp, shareholders versus stakeholders or not, the rules are changing. And so all of that led to a view that we're sort of dealing with this frog in the pot syndrome that uh, certainly the directors I interviewed um, were, I'll use the word advisedly, were manfully sort of trying to just get through the task, um, but the heat was cranking up and nobody was really standing back and saying, well, what is the end game here? Is this actually sustainable? Or is there is there some fundamental um, set of pressures that's going to overwhelm us? 
particularly in what we talk about is this VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We all, or many people use those words, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The question is, how does the board actually respond to that? Or is it just using the words, but actually not changing its own design? So that's the lead. And if we could roll over, Sean, please roll forward. So I'll go very quickly through this because it's fairly detailed. But if you look in the left arc, there were some trends that we were observing very clearly. I'm not providing a forecast to you, ladies and gentlemen, but just saying let's observe these trends and if they play out, there could be some consequences. So I've touched on the government's trend, governance trend number one, the increasing voice of stakeholders. Everybody's got a megaphone. We've got greater democratization of decision making. That means that shareholders expect to have their voices heard and they will be asking why did you invest in this and not that, etc. cetera. Um, greater demands for accountability. I think we're all painfully aware of that. The rate and scale and sophistication of change is ramping up. That's trend number four. And trend number five at the bottom left-hand side of that arc is around more complicated business ecosystems. And of course, the observation is, which I sort of touched on, is that your customers are dispersed into often far-flung markets that you'll never visit. Um, your Workforce could be dispersed equally, and I'm not just talking about call centers, but you've got gig workers and people in different parts of the world you may never meet directly, but they're all part of it. You've got supply chain that's dispersed, um, different components made in different geographies that you might never visit, and capital is dispersed as well. So you've got what I've called the great dispersion. And so the question is, how do you, as a challenge, how do you keep effective optics on that great dispersion? How, as board members, do you really feel informed about it? Uh, on the right, without going into it, you can read in your own time, we've color-coded it into the elements of a operating model, namely the board management systems. It includes the project, the, the charters of the board, its constitution, et cetera, the use of uh, technology, and of course, data, the participants, who they are, and the skills they bring, the processes you're following, the structures that you deploy on the board, including how you allocate responsibilities. And of course, then the ways of working, how do you actually perform? How do you think? How do you make decisions, et cetera? All of these are topics I'm sure you're familiar with, but together those six elements form the operating model. And we could see significant pressure emerging from those trends on the left to the right. The nature of the agendas, how you're going to engage in a meaningful, authentic way with different stakeholders, how you're going to defend the decisions you're making, because those could get relitigated three to five years from now. And we're already seeing that with uh, um, energy and energy markets, as well as in environmental impacts. Um, you're going to have to find new ways to attract talent to the board. Um, you're going to have to find ways of using data powered decision making. You're going to have to be ready for far rate, greater rate and pace and cadence of change, etc. So all of those are uh, not predictions, but they're observations about some of the pressures you're going to be facing. Sean, may we roll on, please? Um, so I'll summarize this in a moment, and then I think maybe, Sean, we can just turn to uh, Linda and Steve to talk about any other observations they may have on trends, and perhaps uh, we encouraged all the participants to contribute other trends they may be seeing. So I've touched on those, the increasing voice, and it's got a set of implications. We're going to have to engage far more effectively in a two-way dialogue. Arguably, we can't just rely on the executive to curate the voice of our stakeholders, whether it's staff, whether it's suppliers, whether it's the providers of our capital, um, whether it's our customers, we're going to have to find a way to hear some of those messages ourselves. Um, and be clear on, you know, who you're going to give priority on what basis. Um, they may be priority stakeholders, but some of the expectations may not be ones you can meet. They may not be legitimate demands. So how do you work through all of that? And how do you develop closer uh, listening posts close to the point of contact? transparency of decision making um, we're going to have to be very clear on how we do it and we're probably going to have to be able to justify some of that on a consistent basis um, after the fact accountability you understand the vulcanness i've touched on and then i've talked about the great dispersion the more complicated ecosystem so i've teed up the topic some of the pressures and some of the implications i'd like to just stop take a breath and hear from maybe linda and, and Stephen on their reflections and then maybe uh, sean others Stephen, do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. So 
This raises you know, two big issues for me, Dean, in all of this. And what I'm hearing in boards around the world is an increasing focus, particularly on uh, stakeholder engagement. So understanding the voices of stakeholders is one thing, but actually having a uh, a really strategic oversight of how we're engaging with those that we don't even know about at the moment. And typically what we find there is that the board's role in this is we leave it to the staff <laughs> rather than the board actually taking a real strategic oversight of who are our key stakeholders? What are, what are we currently doing with them? What should we be doing? Who are the stakeholders that we want in five or 10 years from now? How do we position ourselves in, in place of doing that? And the thing that the thing that's a, a bit worrying in all of this is that many boards haven't put any intellect or time into trying to understand what proper stakeholder engagement is. Again, it's been primarily left up to staff. So that whole area of stakeholder engagement, I think, is one of the big issues that um, boards really haven't structured themselves in a way that they can truly understand. Linda. Yeah, great. Look, I was going to follow up on on a similar theme in terms of the the voice of of stakeholders, looking at it from um, the future perspective and looking and seeing that we've got fifty three trillion US dollars of wealth being transferred in the next ten years between baby boomers and the Generation Zs and millennials and so on, and from my perspective, I look at that and I say, well, that is going to change the buying power and the investment power significantly because the younger generation has quite different values than baby boomers. And so what that says to me is that the voice of the stakeholder is going to significantly change who we need to engage with. And so your point, I suppose, Stephen, and, and Dean, um, around knowing who our stakeholders are and, um, and knowing why they want to do business with us and the board being very clear about our why, our purpose, and our values, so that we can actually engage with those people that really want to do business with us, and um, and that have a shared sense of belief and um, and values. Because of course, that's why people do business with with you much more than just the product, because your product can be delivered or your service can be delivered by many. So that. Um, key point that you've raised, Stephen and Dean, around the voice of the stakeholders and clearly identifying who they are is, to me, a critical uh, critical one going forward. And, and also your point, Stephen, about um, often it's left, the board leaves it to management or, or staff. I mean, there are times when that's absolutely fine, but the key thing is for boards to understand who are they accountable for the relationships with, and in the um, Aotearoa New Zealand context, be, context being very clear about what does the um, um, the cultural ramifications have for that in Aotearoa, because iwi mana whenua, you've got to actually be thinking about, okay, what might be fine in a different context, we actually need to be very cognizant of here with Te Māori. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, lovely comments and very much on topic. And of course, if you're going to engage with those stakeholders who are said are increasingly dispersed, uh, whether it's suppliers, staff, uh, investors, etc., um, that takes time. It takes time. And often you're going to, you know, it requires extra investment and we're all stretched. We're all busy. Uh, management, we can't rely on just to curate that stuff because even if they're trying to do it honestly and with very good intent, uh, we all bring our own mindsets to things, right? And we discount certain things that people may be saying um, or we don't give much emphasis. So those weak signals can get lost, not necessarily deliberately. And you think just about some of the, uh, you know, some of the noise around Qantas, for example, where, you know, clearly um, the board wasn't reading the room, um, wasn't relying heavily on a director who said, don't worry, it's just a bit of griping from unhappy customers about baggage or about refunds, et cetera, it will pass, you know, um, what is one actually listening properly, properly to those weak signals and those other voices? You can't be everywhere as a director. So the question is, how do you build those effective mechanisms to tap those voices? So anyway, I do apologize for the density of the slide, but essentially we can see changes to the board management systems and processes. We're going to have to move at a faster rate. Um, 
you know, the old definition of, of governance, board governance, that is, uh, ex Cadbury, I mean, there are other variations, is, is, the, is that governance is a system for controlling and directing companies. And we have to say to ourselves, is the idea of control in a VUCA world actually an anathema? You know, is it an illusion, a hallucination that we can actually control things? Um, and how do you then develop more loose arrangements around a board without giving away all of that? But how do we manage our own expectations? As I said, we can't be everywhere like chicken man. How do we do that? How do those management systems need to become also more fluid so we don't just follow this rigid cadence of meetings? How do we build in, uh, you know, greater flexibility? Technology and data, I've touched on. I mean, boards, you know, hot topic, you know, maybe covered already on these sort of uh, webinars is directors responding to AI. But the fascinating debate is not having more digitally savvy directors, whatever that may mean, or AI in the business. It's actually saying to yourself, well, how will AI actually change the behaviors in the boardroom itself? So it's not just artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. Are we saying to ourselves, instead of debating um, whether we are making the right, right AI decisions for the company itself, are we saying, well, five to 10 years from now, instead of us being so fixated on whether we should have eight directors or 12 directors, actually, are we saying to ourselves, it's quite possible we could have just four directors and you know, two augmented intelligence systems in the boardroom that are doing fact checking, that are doing projections, that are doing all sorts of other things to augment us, not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. Are we having those kinds of conversations? I know that's confronting. It's not a conversation, you know, that's tactical. It's a bigger conversation. The process I've touched on, the participants, given the short, uh, you know, the shortage of these hot skills, the fact that we want to get in, you know, um, arguably people who are at the top of their game, you know, and maybe of a different age, um, you know, how are we going to find ways to accommodate them, particularly if the risk return payback is limited? Do we put them on advisory boards? Do we find looser arrangements to do that? Regardless of what company law says today, I don't want that to be the constraint. Um, we all are familiar with the King decision about directors' responsibilities and liabilities when they're influencing decisions. The law will catch up. But how do we supplement this board? Because we can't be all-knowing, all-seeing experts. Much as we would like to be, we can't be. Um, the ways of working... How do you move at a faster rate, dealing with some of the ambiguity? And then structurally, you know, why do we all have a FRAC? Or why do we all have a, you know, people and culture committee? Why is that? You know, does that make sense? If structure follows strategy and the values created in particular segments or particular geographies or particular divisions, you know, why aren't some of the committee structures mimicking that? For example, it's a, it's a question. I'm not saying one ought to go down that route, but why is it that way? Are we actually mirroring the operational arrangements of the business itself? Or are we just saying, well, we need a frack, we need a you know, govern noms committee, we need this, we need that, because everybody else has got one. Why should we be like everybody else? If governance is fit for purpose, why don't we say, well, we are fairly unique and therefore we need certain arrangements as long as we can reliably say we're executing proper oversight. So some big questions behind those observations. And um, let's just do a quick poll. And then I would very much like to turn to Stephen and Linda again, if that's all right, just for their quick thoughts. But let's, should we run the quick poll now, Sean? All right. So first one is, and please, one is disagree, five is strongly agree. Here's the first statement. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Summarizes my preferred approach to governance reform. Where would you be on that scale? The next one, the board or boards that I'm on are focused on continuous improvement. We're continuously fine tuning what we're doing. Uh, we're doing board surveys. We are just doing post match debriefs as a board, et cetera. And we're doing all of that. And we're continuously looking for ways to improve. Number three, the board mechanisms, the processes, the arrangements around the board and changes to these are keeping pace with the changes in the enterprising model. In other words, we are in sync. So as the organizational arrangements are changing, as the way your CEO is changing how he or she may govern the enterprise, the enterprise, so too the board 
is in sync with that and staying across it? Or is it just, well, we expect the CEO to be far more efficient and effective because we're perfect, we don't have to change. So there's another question for you, ladies and gentlemen. Number four, I feel that on my boards, our board models, I've spoken now about operating models, our board models or arrangements are up to the challenges of our enterprise and its context for the foreseeable future. In other words, we've looked out at our three to five year strategy, we've looked out at our environment three to five years or maybe further, and the way we've set up the board, the way we construed it, the way we're running it, et cetera, uh, we are confident it's up to those challenges. The next one is the one uh, that Stephen and Linda were also talking passionately to, thinking about the boards I'm, I am on when I think about being tapped into the needs and expectations of our key stakeholders, those key constituencies, I feel that as a non-executive director, we have reliable mechanisms to hear the voice of those groups. You know, and reliable is beyond just perhaps what the CEO is telling you. Mm. And the last question, when I think about having access to different perspectives and strategic insights or scarce technical expertise, my preferred view is to have these directly on the board. In other words, bring them in as nets, not at arm's length or in separate structures. Where is our preference? If we say we need these skills, do we then start searching them for them as nets? Or are we saying, well, they don't necessarily have to be. It's not, we're living in this non-binary world. They don't necessarily need to be on the board. All right. Um, I'd love to see further responses. Um, looks like we've got 20 participants. Voting. Sean, how long do you want to keep this open, mate? Oh, you just tell me when you want to uh, close okay. it down, Dean. All right. All right. Well, maybe you can leave it. Do, do, if we move on to the next slide, can it run in the background or not? Yep. Okay. Well, maybe we can just leave it running in the background. And if others can multitask, that would be great. So maybe, uh, Linda and Stephen, you, if you've got some reflections on the possible changes to the operating model elements that I covered earlier. Um, that would be helpful, and then we can we can crack on. Um, can I just um, highlight, uh, Margaret has lost her access to the survey, so I'm not sure if that's something you can sort out, Sean, or not. But, um, yeah, if you could do something in the background to ensure that she has access. I'll see what I can do there. Thanks. So Linda, much. do you want to kick off on this one? Yeah, look, um, so really, I suppose the question that we're being asked is, um, how do we see operating models being impacted by the world that we're, we're basically having to operate in. And um, one of the things that really highlights, uh, highlight that you highlighted for me, Dean, was the fact that a lot of the time we're looking at um, a particular approach to governance. Then that approach is seen and determined by what is seen as best practice, whether we're looking at the ISO 37000 or we're looking at doing um, <clears throat> the um, the Institute of Directors in whichever country we're in, what they suppose or propose as being the best practice. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why we have got such um, a, um, a clear model of governance, because it means that people can evaluate themselves against a standard and identify where they could do some things better. The, the, I think what you're saying is that... Um, by all means, do that and get your your feedback against those particular standards of good good governance. Um, but then ask yourself, and what else? Because it's that question that says, okay, well, we're doing these things well, um, but are these things exactly what we need to be doing in this particular environment? Are there things we need to shift in how we're operating that may actually be better? Um, but I think it's quite challenging for boards because, well, maybe it's because of the business that both Stephen and I are in, and maybe you as well, Dean, is that a lot of boards aren't actually doing so well in the current environment. And so um, then to actually say, well, take the next step up and say, all right, what do we need to do differently? Because we're in this incredibly uh, fast-paced environment um, is, is maybe a step too far when they can't necessarily get all the basics right. Do you know what I mean? What do you think, Stephen? Yeah, um, look, the, I think a lot of this 
if we go back to real basics on this, which is um, what I would call being strategic about it, but if we go back to real basics, the role of any board is not to meet. The role of any board is not to monitor. The role of any board is very simply to make the choices that create the future for the communities we serve. And you know, strategy, risk, finance, they're all tools to help us do that, to make the choices that we need to make. So if you go back to that fundamental and say, what do we need to know to be able to know what the choices are that are available to us? Now, what can we put in place to help us understand what those choices are? And you, you don't want a finance committee, for example, that's just giving you a set of financial figures. You want a finance committee that's giving you strategic insight into what are the choices we've got, not only now, but in five years' time to start preparing us for, for this very fast-moving thing. What are these choices that we've got? And are these choices creating the future? What do we know about the future? What, what do we want to do with the future? So even on the finance committee, they should be having a strategic um, mindset about how is this going to have an impact on the future, which is usually depicted through your vision or your purpose statement. How is this going to have an impact? Is this finance committee the, still the right way of doing it? And I've seen many finance committees, really, it should be disbanded because they're made up of um, people, sometimes accountants, sometimes not, that their only job is to present the uh, spit out from my or QuickBooks. And there's no strategic interrogation or insight from them, let alone the rest of the board. So coming back to um, you know, role of the board, make the choices that create the future for and with the communities that we serve. Who are these communities? How do we know? What are we going to do about them? These are the strategic questions. And then comes the structural stuff, Dean, that you're talking about, which is brilliant, which is now what can we put in place that will help us do all of that? And this is where I've come across um, probably in the last 10 years some very innovative governance models that organisations have put up that break all the rules. We've got one at the moment. There's 16 on the board, yeah, and some of their board members think that's way too many, and others are saying, well, actually, it works really well. <laughs> yes, it's clunky, but look at all the good stuff, and you haven't convinced us that we need to reduce the size because you know, between seven and nine is the ideal size according to X, Y, and Z. So I think um, this is a fantastic conversation for boards to have, Dean, in terms of what is it that we want to actually create and, and is what we've got, is it working? And if it's not working, what do we need to change to actually get it working? Back to you, Dean. Can I just add, I'm just looking at your slide there, Dean, which I think is, is a really interesting one, and, and say that um, one of the things that I think is really important if we're going to have things like stakeholder councils or stakeholder groups that the boards interact with or whatever, is we just need to be very, very clear about the various roles of these yes. different yes. groups and councils. Yes. Yes. Um, because without that, um, that lack of clarity just brings chaos and confusion. Got it. Got it. Well, maybe I thank you. That's fabulous comments from both of you. And Sean, I before we crack on, I mean, all of us are familiar with this sort of the conventional setup arrangement here. It will vary from organization to organization. The key message I wanted to give before we look at some alternative arrangements, just as sort of provocations to the audience now, is, you know, this is quite a linear mechanism, a hub and spoke arrangement between the various committees. Uh, the decision making, you know, they may recommend, but decision making is centralized. There's, you know, in the, bo in, in the board itself, and we've got those various stakeholder groups that are generally curated through the CEO and the leadership team. That's kind of the conventional arrangements that all of us are familiar with. Um, um, and, and the decision-making um, through those board charters is still very much dissolved, devolved down to the decision, uh, to the executive in terms of the delegations of authority, but the board retains full accountability centrally. We'll crack on if we could. Um, here is, a, you know, the possibility of a hybrid model. So, you know, one of the things, and I, I'm mindful of time now, but um, a board, if you think about it, is largely a closed system at the moment. It is, its processes are known to the board, but not necessarily many other people. Its deliberations are known to the board and not many other people. The participants are limited, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's essentially a closed system. And if you buy into the fact that we're living in this VUCA world, um, you don't need to be a, a microbiologist to know that when you're dealing with entropy, with rapid changing in the environment, closed systems don't particularly do very, very well. 
So how do we create more features of an open system? And if we could just roll back one sec, please. Um, over here, uh, the hybrid model, um, you know, you've still got those committees, but maybe you've got some committees that are aligned with with a business units and where the value is created, where the risks might sit. You might have a representative group of, from management, which is a, an attribute of the two-tier board that we tend to find in the Nordic countries. You may have an internal shadow board of high talent from the, uh, you know, the future leadership team. And uh, that's, so that's broadening the participation, sharing the workload, but it's still centralized decision-making. So there's another set of attributes. It doesn't look quite like the conventional board we know. Um, but starting to open up participation. Next one. Here one, uh, this is uh, a further expanded version of that. It's more open. It's still hub and spoke, but we've got a enhanced COSEC function, um, which uh, is doing some of the uh, work that a classic COSEC team doesn't do. If you're thinking about the uh, role of boards, um, which is in one sense to do sense checking, in other words, what the executive is telling us is happening. Is it really happening? Or if the executive is saying, here's the business case, can we sense check it? Can we validate it? Um, that's one key role of boards. I'm not talking about, you know, oversight compliance. It's actually sense checking. And another one is um, sense making. Are we picking up those weak signals from our customers, from our staff, from our communities, from our suppliers? Are we making sense of the future? Um, and so there's an argument that says actually enhanced COSEC can do some of the sense checking. So you don't have to bloody ch check the maths of all the, um, the financial statements coming into the audit committee. You know, it's all being done for you and maybe AI can do some of that stuff and truth in advertising. Maybe you don't call yourself a board. You call yourself a value council because we're there about creating value for the enterprise long-term for shareholders and for stakeholders. Maybe we'll think about ourselves differently. Are we really creating value? as a board and don't treat ourselves as a board anymore. So there's another set of arrangements with some of those customer accounts, the supply council. The third um, one is a networked board. And if you start to think about the dispersed worlds we're living in with uh, business ecosystems, there's lots of literature and in the articles um, that uh, I've referred to in the appendix, um, some articles I've written about networked arrangements where you've got decision-making nodes Right, And so this isn't just devolved decision-making from top downwards, but it's actually more dispersed. Maybe you've got decisions within you know, parameters being made closer to the point of action by the customer group, by the community group, um, by the ESG node. You've got a mix of advisory boards mapped in there, et cetera. Plus, you've also got some classic standard committees. So the focus of here is it's all not centralized just in the board actually you've got freedom within boundaries in some of these nodes so you can move at a faster pace responding to uh, evolving events as you need to but of course we know with networks for networks to be efficient information needs to flow fluidly from node to node um, and also uh, you need high levels of trust so highly effective communication and high levels of trust. So it's not a model for the faint-hearted. Just go back one moment, if you don't mind, um, Sean. Um, I've also, to be provocative, called it a stewardship council. Well, I, you know, we've got participants today from New Zealand. I used to be um, head of strategy for Fonterra. And I remember there was a word for guardianship called kaitiaki, um, which is, you know, the stewardship. Um, we are here ultimately to ensure that the asset is left in a better condition for future generations, mm -hmm. right? And it's that point of view. So again, do we think of ourselves not as a board of very important guys and girls, you know, who are unbelievably smart and capable? Do we actually think of ourselves in a far more humble way? And I'm sorry to be provocative because I'm not trying to have a go at any of the participants, but, you know, we have to recognize we are all fallible. We can get big decisions wrong. So, do we approach it with this sense of guardianship that this asset needs to far outlast us and our reputations? Um, and we approach our decision-making in a different way with a dispersed set of decision-making capabilities. Very different way of thinking about the world. Um, but again, as I say, operating models are not just about structures. 
for this model to work, you've got to behave in different ways. You've got to have different processes. You've got to use technology in different ways. You've got to have different management systems. The whole box and dice of the operating model needs to be different for it to succeed. I need to wrap up, I believe, now, um, Sean, and there may be some closing comments. But um, ultimately, just the last slide is, uh, the, sorry, pre-last pre slide, one back, um, is as you start thinking about fit for future purpose, not to just today's purpose, but for the future. I mean, obviously, it requires a deep consideration of your context and how that might be changing, a proper consideration of the life cycle stage the business is in, a proper understanding of complexity that you're dealing with, how complicated, complicated is one thing, complex is another, but how complicated is our world? Um, the North Star of our purpose, um, if it's going to be fit for purpose, you've got to be darn sure you've really understood your purpose. Um, otherwise, it's pointless, right, trying to be fit for purpose. The focus of the key outcomes and strategies we're trying to achieve that not only determines the skills you need, but a whole bunch of other things. And lastly, a consideration of structural alternatives. So there, there you go. I'm sorry it's been, uh, you know, I've ripped through the slides quite quickly. It's a big topic. The, you know, the, the genesis, sorry, the, the last message is uh, one, I think, from Bill Gates that he said, when the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. When the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. You don't have to take those words literally, but I think you need to say to yourselves, are we keeping up with that rate of change? Because you've only got four options, right? The one is to say, well, we're fine. No change is required. You know, governance is governance. We're following the rest of the herd. We're okay. Um, that's one option. Second one is to paddle faster, to just double down and say, well, we're going to put aside more time for more committee meetings, for more conversations. We're going to double down. I'm going to do more reading. I'm just going to try harder, I'm going to paddle faster. The next, so it's the second option. The third option is to say, you know what? We're being overwhelmed by all of this. We can only find time to do proper compliance or whatever it is. And we're going to narrow down our focus and go back to basics. So that's a minimalist approach. I'm not saying anything is right or wrong. And the last option is the expansionist approach to say, well, we've got all these people wanting more from us, more shareholders, more stakeholders, more demands, more topics. Actually, we're going to find a way for a more augmented operating model so we can do more and create more value. So those are your four choices. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry, it's not been a longer time to engage properly, but I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Dean. Just to finish off, we have a comment from Peter, uh, which he says more radical thinking on models may be too fast for corporate legislation to ever catch up. Your thoughts on that? Well, I know Steve's got a, a law background, as, as, as do I, but I think, you know, the law is often a mirror of social and commercial reality. And it's not often that the Lord leads the way it's usually responsive. So I think, you know, the, the tried answer is we need to do what we think is right with the courage to do what we think is right. And the law will ultimately catch up. We can't use the law as an excuse or a crutch on all matters. Sometimes we actually have to run ahead of it. If that's if the right I would, view. If I would add to that, Dean, um, also there's enough flexibility in it for you to create a governance system that's fit for purpose for you right now. We see many organisations, and particular in the not-for-profit sector, they are outstripping the rest of the sectors because they have to. Mm. And they're, they're, they're using the existing legal frameworks to create stuff. They still haven't quite got it right in some areas, you know, but, but nevertheless, I'm seeing some very, very innovative structures that are being created, and they work. That's the most important question. Do they work? Thanks, team. Dean, appreciate it. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Linda and Stephen. Uh, now, as you leave the webinar, everybody, don't forget our quick one-minute survey. It's actually a two-minute survey. Um, if you fill that out, you'll go in the drawer to win our gift hamper. Uh, we'll announce the winner just after our session today. Um, that's a wrap-up, everybody. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thanks again. Have a great day.